three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our study of the book of Second John, True Knowledge Leads to Truth. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Wadsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, who is the audience uh, and author of Second John? Well, what's interesting about uh, many uh, letters in the New Testament or uh, books in the New Testament, as well as books in the Old Testament, is that we have to depend on the memory of uh, people that lived uh, centuries ago to pass on to us, if you will, the story about who uh, wrote some of these and why they were included in scripture. Because if you look at, uh, as we're going to today, uh, the author is not clearly identified. He refers to himself as the elder. Uh, obviously, there would be a number of people that could be called the elder, uh, function in the elder role within congregations. Um, but uh, we believe that this was written by the apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, and we just finished looking at 1 John, which is a general letter he uh, appeared to write to uh, a whole area of churches, that, a general letter that addressed a concern that he had. Uh, this particular letter appears to possibly be sent to one particular congregation, although we can't be absolutely sure. Uh, but the way he addresses it seems to suggest that. And uh, secondly, interestingly enough, next week we'll look at 3 John is addressed to an individual. And some have speculated that 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John went out at about the same time, carried perhaps with the same person uh, to be circulated, 1 John among all the churches, 2 John to be sent to a particular congregation, and then 3 John to a specific individual that John wanted to, to communicate with, which we'll look at next week. Now, we don't know that to be the case, but there's enough similarities between these that it's a possibility that that may be the case. And therefore, for years, these three letters may have been viewed as the same basic letter because they were sent out at the same time. Uh, but even though we don't know exactly who the audience was, we do have, I think, some pretty interesting identification of what the problem was uh, that was being addressed. So let's uh, pick up. This again is one of the shortest uh, one chapter uh, books in the New Testament. So it won't take us long to traverse through it, but let's get started by looking at the first three verses. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Bruce, what role did the elders play in the uh, New Testament church? What's interesting is if you read the average commentary on the, this book, they assume right off the bat that references to elders is of course the same as pastors, which is true, which is just a anglicized word for shepherd. Um, but they assume these are the local ministers within churches. So to say that someone's an elder and therefore when, uh, you know, Paul told Timothy to appoint elders that he was talking about appointing uh, individual ministers for congregation. But uh, some facts uh, challenge, I think, that understanding. First of all, every time we read about elders in the book of Acts, elders is a plural, even though it's talking about, in many cases, one congregation. So there's not one elder in a congregation. There's a plurality, two or more. Uh, which makes sense. You'd want to have uh, leadership more than one person. 
And uh, that I think is the case. But also people confuse uh, various terminology. Uh, the word term minister just means a servant. And so all Christians are, are you know, seeking to be servants of the Lord and servants of others. So that's a rather generic term. Uh, evangelist is what uh, uh, Paul, I think, uh, refers to when he, when he talks to Timothy and others who are doing the work of uh, spreading the good news message. But to really get a fullness of the idea of, the, of all that's involved in elder, we have to remember that there are three terms for uh, elder, bishop, sometimes translated overseer, manager, that's what bishop means, uh, are the word shepherd or pastor. These are three terms that refer to the same function, you know, spiritual leaders uh, of uh, local congregations. Now, we read uh, and studied First Peter recently, and I think it'd be good to go back to First Peter uh, chapter 5 and the opening verses to get a feel for how all three terms are used in reference to the same function of uh, elder. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Yeah, so the threefold uh, designation occurs here and occurs also in Acts uh, uh, chapter 20, where here Peter identifies that besides being an apostle, he is an elder of a local congregation, a fellow elder, and he says, but also shepherd of the flock of God, which they are too, and who are exercising oversight or which is the idea of bishoping or overseeing. Uh, and he says, you know, do it for the right motives, not to be a domineering, controlling person of the local church, but instead to be an example of Christ-like living. That's what elders are supposed to be. Uh, they are given, I think, the responsibility to provide leadership for local church, but they're supposed to be examples, uh, most of all, uh, not uh, just figureheads uh, of some side. So here, I think, is, as the letter of uh, 2 John begins, John identifies himself uh, as an elder. He calls himself the elder. Um, we think, and this again based on historical data in the early church, that uh, John settled uh, in his older years in the city of Ephesus, where he was a leader in the church. So this is probably uh, where he is when he writes these letters. And so he is an elder of the Ephesian church. And he writes, notice, identifies to the elect lady and her children. Well, that's, again, uh, idea of a feminine uh, personality of children. I think it's just another um, exquisite way of referring to the church. The church is the bride of Christ. It's the elect, the chosen lady, the chosen people of God and her children. So I think it's referring to the church, but probably here in the context, uh, even an individual congregation. Um, and he says, we, all, we who know the truth, because the truth that abides in us will be with us forever. So right off the bat, he kind of nails down, I think, the fundamental point he's trying to make in his letter, and that is that as Christians, we know the truth. Now, what is the truth? Well, the truth is, as Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know Jesus' real identity. He is the truth of God, the reality of God. He was fully God and fully man. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. We know his real identity, God in the flesh. Um, that's his identity. That's the truth 
about Jesus. But also Jesus said in the Gospel of John, as he prayed to God, your word is true. And so God's word, Old and New Testament, also is our source of truth. Matter of fact, that's how we know who Jesus is. In an accurate way, we could have heard about it, but we have something uh, in the scriptures to be able to clearly define who Jesus was uh, and what his true identity is. So in order to be uh, true people of God, we have to base our spiritual life on knowledge, as he talked about in 1 John, in contrast, true knowledge versus the false knowledge of some of the false teachers, uh, which leads to an understanding of the truth, who Jesus is and what God's word teaches about who God is, who we are, what our purpose is, and how we should live. All of that is a part of the truth that's revealed in Christ. And so he's reminding them, look, it's not like we're waiting to discover the truth. The fundamental truth that he's concerned about, they already know. And now he's concerned that they stick with the truth and not wander uh, away from it. And then he does a greeting as oftentimes uh, people did writing letters. Uh, grace and peace are common terms. Grace is a common uh, term of expression used by the uh, secular uh, Greeks. And peace, shalom, was a common greeting by the Jews. He just adds one term more than the normal by adding mercy. And so he's mindful of God's divine mercy in addition to his grace and peace. He reminds them this will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. I like the way he said, in truth and love. Now, what's interesting is in our society, people tend to split love and truth as if the two can't come together. But in true Christianity, we only know what true love is because we know the truth, who God is who God has made himself known as. And by knowing the truth, we know what real love is versus what is not love. So truth and love are in sync with one another. They're not like two unrelated things. Oh, here's the loving person. Here's a person just concerned about the truth. The two of them are inextricably connected together and are a core of our understanding of who we are in Christ and what our true identity should be. And so that's how he starts off uh, his letter. And then let's pick up and see what he further says, verses uh, four and five. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Bruce, why did John rejoice greatly? Well, he seems to have heard about the life of an individual congregation from someone that had traveled to where he was. He says, I'm, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. So he's heard the, uh, from some that some, not everybody, but a good significant part of the congregation are walking in the truth. Now, anytime in the New Testament, he uses walking as an Old Testament expression for how you conduct your life. Your walk is how you conduct your life. And so he's glad to hear and greatly rejoices to hear that there are some, even though there have been false teachers and bad influence, that, that some have continued to remain in the truth that's in Jesus, just as we were commanded uh, by the Father. Um, and so he says, I just want to remind you 
to keep on doing what you've really heard from the beginning, and that is that we love one another. As we found in 1 John, some of the false teachers turned out to be haters. They were hostile, uh, angry people, causing dissension and division. They perhaps were arrogant. Uh, and all these sort of things caused a great upheaval with these false teachers that were among the congregation. And what got lost in all that was the importance of Christ-like love. And of course, this is the commandment you've heard from the beginning, and that love is continued to walk in all the commands of God. So we show true love by doing everything that God wants us to do and following the example of Jesus. But it's really all about love. And of course, it's interesting. John is probably the writer of this. It's only in the Gospel of John we hear that clear expression of mutual one another love uh, and the example of Jesus. We find in uh, the Gospel of John chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 34 and 35. Excuse me, John 13, verse 34 and 35. I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize for that. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, of course, the Old Testament commanded us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It even said, love your neighbor as yourself. What's new about this commandment is we are to love one another as Jesus modeled what love should be as he showed his disciples how to truly love one another. So he's defined this in an even clearer term than loving neighbor as self, because sometimes we might love ourselves in, in a way that's unchristlike. And so he says, love one another as I've loved you. And what I find interesting is he said, this is the one clear thing that the most secular people can see if you create a community where people really love one another, this is going to stand out. People are going to take notice. Now, John and I just uh, recently had an interesting experience. Uh, someone uh, showed up uh, at church and uh, engaged a few people there. I don't think they were intending to perhaps get involved. They just kind of stopped by to see what the church building was like, came at the end of the service but uh, got engaged with John and other people, later got engaged with me. And here's what that person said. This person said, you know, the world's filled with all kinds of selfish people and people you can't trust. But I really felt like that when I got here and engaged that you were really genuine people that really cared about uh, others. Well, that's, that's what we want people to notice. And I think we don't realize how rare it is this person was saying, I don't know anywhere where you can count on finding that kind of, uh, of love, respect, and integrity for one another. So that's what we want to be exhibiting. That's what Christ said, all people know, you're really my disciples, if that's the kind of relationships you have with one another. And so he just reminding them of that essential quality that they need to keep foremost in their mind as they're living out their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, let's continue on with the next verses. John, uh, yeah, we're in seven and eight. Did we read that? Yeah, I don't think we have seven and eight. Correct. Uh, let me get to it there. I apologize once again. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Uh, Bruce, what does this tell us about 
why John wrote this letter? Well, again, just like first John, there were false teachers. Um, notice here, he says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. The world of the first century is a lot like the world of the 21st century. There are all kinds of people promoting spirituality, uh, even forms of Christianity that are not authentic, but yet attract large groups of people. People find it interesting and entertaining and novel and new, uh, and these are deceivers. And you're not effective as a deceiver if you don't deceive anybody. So these people are able to do so. Um, and who are these deceivers? Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. We noted that in, the, in 1 John, that one of the elements that were being denied by the false teachers he was opposing was they denied that Jesus came in the flesh. Now, all that may seem to be a vague idea, but we have to keep in, in mind, this was first century Greek culture. And in the Greek culture, you go back and read Plato and others, they basically disparaged the physical existence and thought the body was dirty and evil, that's the flesh, and only in the soul and the mind is pure. And so they longed to get rid of their bodies and be consumed in, the, in their soul, their eternal soul, and, and which was their mind and reason. Well, uh, Christianity doesn't say the body is dirty and evil. It says that, yes, there's part of us that's capable of evil, but it's not just the physicality of us. So there's nothing wrong with God coming in the flesh. Doesn't mean that he partakes in evil or something lesser than. It's God becoming one with us, identifying fully with us so that he can save us. And so to deny Jesus came in the flesh might fit in in a first century setting if you're trying to uh, come up with a view of Christianity that would appeal to Greek philosophy, but it denied a fundamental truth about Jesus' identity. And so people may not deny that in our society, but they may acknowledge Jesus came in the flesh. They just deny his divinity. Uh, they deny that he was God. So, you know, people always uh, selectively deciding what kind of Jesus they want to believe in. A great moral teacher, they'll say. Um, uh, but the true Jesus is the son of God. He's a messianic king. Uh, he came in the flesh. He was raised from the dead in the flesh. And he offers us eternal life, which will eventually mean we will experience life after death by inhabiting resurrection bodies. Not, we'll not live as disembodied spirits, but as re-embodied people, not the same old bodies, but a spiritual body that will be immortal, which is obviously different than the body we have now. But notice he's saying, look, they're deceivers. They're not telling the truth. Watch yourselves so you do not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. So he's basically saying, you know, up this time, some of you have worked at trying to do the right thing. Don't abandon your spiritual life and lose your final reward, which will come at the return of Jesus. Instead, stay faithful uh, to what he's called us to. But let's look back at a couple of passages, kind of. Uh, shed a little, uh, you know, highlights on this. First uh, Timothy uh, chapter four, verse one, tells us a little more about deceiver. Now the Spirit expressly says that in la later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Yeah, so... It's not just John that knew this. Paul, writing it earlier, said, you know, the Spirit has already revealed that in the latter days that we live in, some will depart from the faith. How? By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. 
Now, you know, we, we're a society that doesn't believe much in demonology unless you go to see movies about them. And they usually totally misrepresent demons in a biblical sense. But we need to be aware that there are spiritual forces in the world trying to counterfeit spirituality to give people something that isn't the real thing. Therefore, deceitful spirits who promote teaching of the demonic, uh, trying to give people a spirit. You know, I'm a spiritual person, but of course, they don't have the truth that's in Jesus. Also, uh, notice here he said they are antichrist. If you remember, that's what uh, John referred the false teachers in 1 John. In 1 uh, John 2, verse 18, he told us that there were many in the world already. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So as Paul predicted in the last times, that the Antichrist would come, and he lets us know it's not just one bad figure that will be the Antichrist, but literally those that offer spirituality and antithesis to Jesus these are the antichrists that influence people, make people think they have something real when it's only full of lies uh, and deceit. And our world is certainly full of that, just like the first century was. And so he reminded them of that. These false teachers, deceivers, are part of the antichrist movement. Um, but also, you know, I, some people will really read selective passages and come up with the idea that if you're truly saved, you, you couldn't possibly fall away. You, you've got to, you know, God's got to save you in the end. And, and they ignore the fact that just like you can choose through faith to follow Christ, you can also reject the faith and abandon your faith and eventually lose uh, your great reward and even lose out on your spiritual hope. Uh, even someone like Paul recognized he had to watch himself, guard himself in order to make sure that didn't happen to him. And that's what he said in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 9, uh, verses 25 through 27. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And so he uses terms that refer to the athletic contests that took place in arenas in the first century world. They ran uh, in races, but they don't run aimlessly. You have to run straight to the goal to win. Uh, they discipline their body. They keep their body under control in order to succeed at the various games uh, that they were involved with in the arena. And all this to receive a perishable wreath. They wrap a little wreath. You're a winner. Uh, it's kind of like uh, when I was in the sixth grade, uh, I won uh, the, the athlete of the year for my little uh, for my elementary school. And they gave me a little plastic, uh, looked like a cup, you know, thing. And it, had taped on there, athlete of the year. And I thought that was so great. And of course, it probably cost about 20 cents at the time uh, to purchase that. Uh, but those are the kind of things that people go to great lengths to win. And he says, what about us? We have an imperishable wreath, uh, what God is providing for us. And But he said, you have to live a disciplined life. You have to go for it in Christ. You can't just wander aimlessly or wander off the path. He said, you could even be disqualified. We know that when somebody runs outside their lanes in a, in a race and interferes with others, they're kicked out of the race. And even if they're the first one to the finish line, their race doesn't count because they get disqualified. And so that's the terminology that Paul is using and saying, even after I preach to others, and they may be saved through my preaching, I could be disqualified if I don't discipline myself to live the truth that I preach about in Christ. Um, so, it's, you know, we want to avoid the two extremes, 
by that I mean, on one hand, we don't want to go around and be constantly insecure about our salvation in Christ. It's a very sure thing. As long as we are faithful and loving in Christ, we don't have to worry about that. But on the other hand, you know, you can't just, <clears throat> after having embraced Jesus, just go and live any kind of lifestyle you want to. Well, I pray Jesus into my heart. I guess I'm free to go sin all I want to do, live life with abandon in a purely sensual and selfish way, and there'll be no consequences. But that's not true. No, it's consequences for the choices we make. And let's avoid the two extremes, insecurity and a false sense of security, and instead recognize as long as we remain faith-centered in Christ, faithful to what we believe, staying in the truth, we don't have to be insecure about our future hope, but we can't abandon reasonable self-discipline and live an undisciplined, ungodly life and think God is going to reward us in the end for such foolish choices. So that's what he's reminding them. And then he goes a, a little bit further as we look at uh, verses 9 to 11. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Bruce, what type of error uh, does the do these uh, teachers, uh, false teachers have, and how should we respond to them? Well, notice he says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not remain uh, in the teaching of Christ. Now, we would use that term like going on ahead. We, in our terminology, that'd be progressive. You know, in our society, we have conservatives and progressives. The sin of progressives is they think as long as, as, long as you're coming up with new and novel uh, new things and that you're moving on to, uh, then you're always moving in the right direction. It's progress. And of course, for some people, progress is deciding, oh, we don't believe in miracles anymore. That was superstitious nonsense. And uh, we just believe in the human Jesus and we just believe in, in, you know, social good rather than personal, individual, moral. Those are just silly nonsense. That's what progressives oftentimes say. So when you progress beyond the teaching of Christ, you have ventured off into fallacy and lies and deceit. Now, conservatives also have their problem. You know, if you are conserving the truth, that's all good. But conservatives tend to not only conserve, keep the truth, but they also have a lot of religious tradition that they want to hold on to. And they embrace their traditions as strongly as they do the truth. And so that's the challenge of conservatism. And then progressivism is always you know, some new novel thing uh, attracts their attention. And unfortunately, some of those new novel things lead them astray. Now, obviously, if we're talking about finding creative ways to communicate Christ, we ought to seek progressive ways to it. There's not just one way to do that. But you don't progress beyond the fundamental teaching of who Jesus is and what he's called us to be. There's no progress beyond that. That's a form of regress. Uh, and we should only be conserving that which is the truth about who Christ is, not a lot of religious traditions about them. We want to be in that healthy middle where the truth of Jesus is. And he's reminding them, everybody that, you know, moves on and doesn't abide in this fundamental teaching that we've received about Christ, um, they've left Christ. They're part of the deceived and the deceivers. Um, whoever abides in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. Uh, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Uh, 
basically he's saying don't extend what would normally be Christian hospitality to people that are false teachers. You know, don't feel obligated because they claim to be a Christian that you've got to extend hospitality to them when they reveal that they're false teachers. And that's where to love people, but we're not to endorse and support false teachers. And so he's telling them, don't support them for whoever greets him. He, he's talking about not just saying hi, but he's talking about greets and welcomes them into his home. Uh, you're taking part in their wicked works. And so we don't want to be a part of people's wicked works. And so he just admonishing them, be mindful of the teacher that comes to you. They're not teaching Christ as you understand him, the truth about Christ. Don't let them in. Don't support them. Don't endorse them, or you will be sharers, partakers in their evil. And we don't want to be partakers with people who are leading other people astray, misleading people, and deceiving others. And so that seems to be what was going on. He's warning them to be aware, watch yourselves, but also watch the people that come in and claim to be uh, true teachers of God. Make sure they're teaching true teaching, the true Christ, not a false Christ, not a pseudo Christ, not progressing beyond to some new and novel understanding of Christ that contradicts the truth that's in Jesus. And then as we think about that, it reminds you of 2 Timothy 4, uh, where Paul kind of alludes to the same sort of thing. Of course, this was that Paul probably died 60 something, 62 or 3 or 4 AD. And this is probably around 90 something uh, AD. So this is years later, but Paul saw this kind of problem coming. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Mm. So people are going to have itching ears. You know, people sometimes want to hear what they want to hear, something that's comforting to them, something that makes them feel good about themselves that's not the truth. Uh, and so he's warning, he's telling here, Timothy, as his work as an evangelist, I charge you, said the presence of God, and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, when he comes, preach the word. Be ready in and out of season. It will involve rebuke, reproof, and exhorting people um, with complete patience and endurance. Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound, and that word is healthy teaching. You know, the truth produces spiritual health. Uh, lies produce spiritual unhealth. And so there'll be those that uh, preach unsound teaching, which is unhealthy teaching, um, to suit themselves and their passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. Whenever people create a Jesus that isn't the real Jesus and a Christianity isn't the real thing, whether they know it or not, they've wandered off into mythology. They're creating their own spiritual mythos, their own spiritual truths, which have nothing to do with the real truth, which is Jesus and the revelation of God's will that we find in the word of God. Um, the appeal for this sort of thing uh, is very great. Uh, you know, people are attracted to some new novel uh, idea that takes a little bit of Christianity and and mixes it with a bunch of other things, a lot of psychology and philosophy. But so many of these things end up leading people astray, not representing the truth, only little bits and pieces of the truth, not the truth as a whole. So that's where we've got to be willing uh, to challenge false teachers and certainly not endorse them, support them, you know, bring them into our home and, 
and give them full fellowship when they are uh, teaching things that are deceitful and will destroy other people's spiritual lives. So that was his concern. And he wraps up things in the last uh, two verses, verse 12 and 13. We'll wrap up this lesson with the last verses of this one chapter of Second John. Though I have much to write you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children, the children of your elect sister greet you. So Bruce, how does John choose to wrap up this brief letter? I think it's interesting. The children of your elect sister, talk to her as the elect lady, greet you, which seems to suggest the members of the congregation where the writer was, which was soon to be John, probably uh, the city of Ephesus. So he sends greetings from his congregation to their congregation. But he ends in an interesting way. And we find Paul say this occasionally. I don't think we realize most of the New Testament letters were written because Paul, John, or some other New Testament writer couldn't go there in person and tell the congregation or individual or group of people what was on their mind. They would have much preferred to have done that. But when they can't do that, and they feel it's really important that you need to hear from me, then reluctantly they sit down and write a missive, uh, which, of course, anytime you write things down, that takes time. Now, imagine in the first century, they'd have literally a pen and a dip it in some ink and write a letter, another letter. Letters took a great deal of time to write. And so these were tedious uh, things. And of course, if you could go see the people, that'd be much better. So John's saying here, I'm giving you a brief word, but of course I'm gonna save everything else I need to say because I'd rather do it face to face. Uh, and so that's the preference of so many New Testament writers. But thank goodness God put these men in difficult circumstances and they were forced to write down some of their thoughts or else we would not have what we now refer to as the New Testament letters uh, that tell us all about uh, Christianity and what it meant in the first century uh, context. Uh, but I want us just to notice one last thing. He said, so that our joy may be complete. So again, this rejoicing, he wants them to share in the rejoicing. He wants to see them face to face, share what's on his heart with them there, make sure they're doing the right thing. They're living with the teaching of Christ that is the truth and not being deceived uh, by false teachers and remain faithful to what they originally were committed to, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that our combined joy may be complete. Does that remind you of something we studied earlier? Remember 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 4? Um, that's a, a similar expression as you wrote this general letter uh, to the churches. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. You see, in Christ, it's not good enough for me to experience rejoice and experience joy. I don't want to just have joy myself. I want to share that joy, the joy that comes from knowing who God is and know he has promised us eternal life, that he has made it a reality by sending his son to make a sacrifice for our sins and to know that because of our faith in him and our walking in the footsteps of Jesus, we have found the real purpose of life and that even death itself cannot defeat our faith because we have resurrection hope. And so with that kind of great hope, no matter what my circumstances may be, I have something to rejoice about. It's, it's a joy that's non-circumstantial, doesn't depend on my circumstance, but it's a joy that transcends my circumstance because it's the truth 
about me and you in eternity. But that joy is never complete unless I share it with others. That's why we share the good news message, why we try to reach out to other people. That's why we help other people live out the truth and understand the truth is in Jesus. Then all of our joy will be united and therefore complete when all of us together experience the joy that comes from the presence of God's spirit in our lives, telling us the truth. We are God's child with a forever purpose in Christ. What a great uh, message. That's the kind of joy that we have in him that's made complete when we share it uh, with other, our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So that's where we'll end uh, tonight's message. And to remind you, next week we look at 3rd John. And uh, coming up after that, I've already begun to, uh, to do a lot of reading in uh, uh, Leviticus, which I think you will find uh, will be a very fascinating study. There are all kinds of really profound insights in the book of Leviticus that I think are oftentimes overlooked because people don't really know uh, what the book is about or what it really teaches. Uh, we know the, that the Israelites gave sacrifice. We have no idea what the sacrifices are for or what the different types of sacrifices are, which can inform our own spirituality. But we'll look at that when we get to it. We got one more week on John before we go there and ask John uh, Walker uh, to wrap us up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, blessing us so richly uh, with the fullness of your holy word. We thank you for your son, Jesus, that through his sacrifice, his life lived in these writings, that we get to see the manifestation of your word and that we believe in your word that Jesus truly is our savior. We thank you for your, your Holy Spirit, our guide uh, and comforter. Uh, that we might be uh, discerners of the truth. And Father, in the midst of all of uh, false uh, teachers and in the midst of uh, circumstances that may want to uh, interrupt us in, for enjoying uh, who you are, Father, we thank you for that joy that transcends all understanding in our circumstances, uh, that we might uh, be uh, heralders of the message of salvation through Jesus. Thank you for Bruce and his ability to make clear your word that we might be equipped uh, to uh, be soldiers um, on the battlefield for you. Uh, bless all who are in attendance live and watching this uh, on the recorded version. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.